the locusts and the heart. Today we get to hear about the locusts and the heart of Pharaoh and learn some uh, valuable lessons as it relates. Pardon me, got a little piece of lint on me. As it relates to us and what we can learn from all of this. It is cold outside, freezing here in Texas, Saginaw, Texas, Fort Worth, Texas. In fact, it's so cold, I called into the office and told myself I'm not coming in. And uh, so there you go. So we <laughs> it is freezing outside. Hey, by the way, a little piece of history today, something that you might find uh, as a blessing and an interest. Today is the Yatzeret of Rabbi Yehuda Lib Alter, who passed away in 1905. And uh, you might be wondering who Rabbi Lib Alter was. He was known as Safe is same as yes, that's right. Today is the Yatzeret of one of our favorite commentators of Torah who passed away in 1905. Safe is same as so, yeah. So, we uh, blessed memory, we thank Hashem for sending him to the earth and giving us a wonderful opportunity to learn Torah. So, uh, Baruch Hashem, so glad you were here this morning. We get to start the Parasha Bo, which is the Parasha of the Exodus. Parasha Bo is the Parasha of the Exodus. The drosh that I taught on Shabbat, we'll be, we'll be revisiting these concepts again this coming Shabbat, of course, is all tied in with the concepts of the uh, Exodus. And so... I realize that uh, it seems to me anyway, you know, as I've, I've said this a couple of different times, but sometimes me giving a drosh and especially this series of you've heard it said, you know, you've heard you've heard this theological concept uh, as an example, you know, the Torah is not for today or something like that or or the, the, the Torah, the law of Moses re demands perfection. Uh, you know, those those things are easy. That's easy, breezy. You can destroy that overnight. You know, there's a, for, by the way, uh, anybody ever seen the bumper sticker? It's for the Marine Corps. And it's so fitting, by the way, because this is exactly what we do and it's how we think. But the bumper sticker says, if it absolutely, positively must be destroyed overnight, call the Marines. Um, <laughs> it's, it's so funny. Anyway, made me think about this. But if those are easy to destroy. The concept that I've been, I was covering on, on, on Shabbat um, is a little bit more challenging because. It's it's kind of a yes and no maybe question. It's very similar but not the same. It's exactly like it but different, and that that's a little bit more challenging to to parse out. My my theme for for the drosh was of course it was multifaceted actually because we I was trying to discuss the essence of the Passover lamb. I was trying to dispel the myth, the falsehood, that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. That's actually not true. And I know that, 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 and see, that's the complicated one because, wait a minute, if we come to Messiah, aren't we, aren't our sins washed away and aren't we in fact made new? Yes. Okay. But it's also not true, biblically, that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. That's just simply not true. Because, and I'm going to bring this out, and I'm going to, I'm going to really focus in on that part, this coming drash, Bezrat Hashem. We're going to see in the scriptures multiple times where God tells us we can achieve forgiveness and there's no blood involved. Okay? But that's only if you're in the covenant. All right? So, um, and then of course, just dealing with the concept of covenant and salvation, what all I mean, it's very complicated and this is very collegiate and that frankly turns a lot of people off because people have been mentally conditioned with respect to religion to want just bumper sticker theology, whatever I can learn in, in 60 seconds, I need to be able to, I need to, for you to be able to teach me all these cosmic things while I hold the hot cup of mocha 
and the blueberry scone. And by the way, I've only got 20 minutes for you to share it with me because I've got that thing. So let's hurry. Okay. And uh, so trying to use your brain and use the gray matter between your ears is not exactly, it's a turnoff for a lot of people. But going back to this concept of Bo and, and Pesach, the blood of the lamb um, is about, it's not about forgiveness of sins. What? No. It's about redemption. And those are two different things. This is why Pesach is referred to as the Festival of Freedom. By the way, good morning. Glad you're here. Please be sure to like this video. Share it with all of your friends. Comment on it. Make sure it gets out there because people need to know this. And if you haven't subscribed to our channel, please do so uh, this very instant, by the way. <laughs> so glad you're here. Uh, by the way, what, pardon my reach for a second. I'm going to grab something. Oh, I'm so sorry. Sorry to do that for you. Well, I'm just going to look at something just so it's amazing because I was looking at this this morning. Uh, five, six, seven, eight. We've had, we had eight subscribers since yesterday morning. Uh, that's amazing. So uh, if you're, if you've, if you subscribed in the last 24 hours, um, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Welcome home. So going back to this concept here. So it's really interesting because the blood of the lamb, you know, John Yochanan said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Um, that's a little confusing because it's like, well, wait, wait a minute. I thought it wasn't about sin. It's about redemption. Yes, it is about redemption, right? And when you come into the covenant vis-a-vis -vis redemption, the added bonus is you come into the covenant completely purified com or, or completely sinless, like, like a newborn babe, born again, right? So, but that's not really the, the main point. The main point is not to forgive your sins. The main point is to bring you into the covenant to redeem you. And that's a huge difference because redemption implies that you now belong to someone else to do something else. You once belonged to somebody else doing th their thing, and now you belong to somebody else doing their thing. But if I just forgive your sins, I'm not implying that you belong to anybody. There's nothing for you to do. I just for simply forgive your sins. You can continue keeping on, keeping on, by, but now you're just clean. Well, that's that's nice. That's good. That's part of the puzzle, but it doesn't imply redemption. That's what the past. That's what the Passover is all about. It's about redemption, and now it brings you into the covenant. And yes, you're pure. But now that you're in the covenant, what happens if you sin? See, this is what. And this is the, the the fourth thing I was trying to dispel was the false notion that now, since we Jews don't have any sacrifices because we don't have a temple, that we can't get forgiveness, and therefore we must ha we must have Messiah. That's not true at all. Once you're in the covenant, there is a methodology to receive forgiveness when you sin, and not all of it includes blood. But that's because you're in the covenant. Anyway. So uh hope that's clear. I'm going to I'm going to continue talking about it. I don't expect if I don't expect this to click overnight because as I said, this is uh this is calculus. This is spiritual calculus, okay? This is not consumer math. Consumer math is what you get on Sunday morning. Calculus is what you get at Lapid Judaism on Shabbat. Okay. Um all right. So going going back to the plagues. So in in the parasha Bo, we have um, this is now this with this parasha we start the eighth plague, which is the plague uh, plagues of locusts. Now, what's interesting, and I I, I wanted, of course, naturally when we're talking about the, the locust plague and and insights related to that and, and so forth. But I also wanted to hone in on something really interesting in this portion because it is in this portion that a stunning statement is made. In chapter 10, verse 1, this is where Parashah Bo begins. It says, Hashem said to Moses, come to Pharaoh, for I... Say I, for I have made his heart and the heart of his servants stubborn so that I can put the signs of mine in his midst. Now, 
Somebody asked a question, and I don't recall exactly how they asked it. This was a week or two ago. Maybe it was last week. They asked the question. They said, well, I wonder. Their, their question was, I wish I had the question in front of me. I want to do it justice. But the question was essentially wondering if the wording of the original language didn't necessarily imply that God made Pharaoh's heart hard, but rather something else. And, I, and I, I'm sorry, I don't recall what the something else was, but the, the, the essence was it of it was, I don't think the person could fathom that God would actually make somebody's hard heart, or excuse me, it's <laughs> a hard heart, their heart hard, because they couldn't imagine that God would shut the door to Teshuva in anybody's face. Well, I, that's understandable. And on the one hand, Teshuva is always open to anybody, no matter what. And that, that's what you need to know. You need to know that no matter what, Teshuva is open to you, uh, even up to the very moment before utter destruction. That's true. What is equally true, simultaneously true, is that sometimes we can get so rebellious in our minds and hearts that ultimately Hashem just gives 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 us over. Now, at what time does that happen? The problem is we have no idea. But to answer this person's question, does the Hebrew actually say that God made Pharaoh's heart hard? And the answer is yes. Vayomir Adonai El Moshe, Bo El Faro, Ki Ani, for I, Ki Ani, Hik Vadti, has made his heart hardened or heavy or blocked it up. Et levo ve et lav, and the heart of Avodav, Lema'an, of his servants. So it actually does say that I, God, have done this. I, Hashem, have done this, okay? Now, this is a really important life lesson for, and, and by the way, it says it here, and then it says it again towards the end of the second Aliyah. Uh, let me see if I can find that just, just for posterity's sake. Um, let's see, where does it say? Ah, uh, yeah, in verse 20, chapter 10 and verse 20. But Hashem strengthened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not send out the children of Israel. So it actually says it twice in between um, par, uh, the first and second Aliyah of Parashah Bo. Now, what does this teach us? Well, it teaches us that... Um, Whenever we feel the unction to make teshuva, to embrace truth, we need to act on that unction. And the more we, re we resist, the more we, we fall into the danger of continually hardening our heart towards Hashem and there will come a point where Hashem will just give us over. And that's a very dangerous point because at that, at that instance, it's, it's as if he has hardened our heart. Now, it goes on to say in the commentary that the reason that Hashem did this is because that he, he wanted to, well, it says in the, in the scripture, and then it, it explains it more in the commentaries, that he wanted to do this specifically to show his glory through Pharaoh. And that's all true, and we'll we'll explore some of those commentaries. But the, the but really the interesting thing is, if you think about it, yeah, okay, that's true. But that could only have been true because Pharaoh refused to heed the voice of the Lord ahead of time. You know, there was a Christian. Um, I don't have very many, understandably so. In fact, probably only one Christian you know, pastor that I admire. And uh, one of them was uh, the, probably the only one was really Charles Finney, who lived in the 1830s up in upstate New York. 
Charles Finney, the reason I like Charles Finney is because I, I've said this before, kind of tongue in cheek, but I kind of mean it. And that if he was alive today, he'd most likely be a Lapid Jew. Um, because he had this, he had this profound understanding that uh, you you actually had to live a righteous lifestyle. Now, albeit he didn't understand about Torah back then and so on and so forth, but back in his day, interestingly, in the 1830s, in, in that particularly in that part of the country, this uh, grace only, free grace, uh, secret sensitive, whatever stuff, and interestingly, free loveism, like the 1960s that kind of hippie free loveism, be with whoever you want, whenever you want kind of thing. That was all going on in New York and upstate New York. And these preachers were just telling people that all they had to do is have faith and nothing else, just believe, you know, the, the unicorn message. And basically that was it. And Charles Finney told people, no, that's not it. That is a, that's called false hope. And he told people that if, if you're not going to, Make if you're not going to repent, if you're not going to accept the Lord, if you're not going to begin to live a righteous, holy life, then don't come to church. Because the more you come and the more you hear the word and the more you harden your heart towards it, eventually God will give you over to a reprobate mind. That was his idea. And he, of course, was a great revivalist and, and preached to thousands, tens of thousands, and turned the world upside down back then. Now, you know, it's all Christianity and all that, and there's a lot of falsehood wrapped up in, in, in the, that faith. And But but in, in just focusing on that, Charles Finney was right. He was right from a Torah perspective that the more you come and the more that you hear truth and you harden your heart towards it, Man, it's not good. And let, let me speak now to parents out there, particularly parents who have young teenagers. It's almost, it, it gets real hard if you have young teenagers and it's it's easier easier if you have younger kids. But let me talk to parents with children in, in, in general, okay? Um, the Lapid Judaism message, statistically speaking, appeals, this has just been proven over many years, looking at analytics and statistics and so forth and so on, this message appeals to a more mature audience. Uh, and the reason for that is obvious because it's it, it, it requires just more maturity in your thinking. When you're young, you're, you're you know, no, no offense to young people, I've been there too a long time ago. Uh, anyway. I once was 20 <laughs> or 30 or 18 for that matter. And, you know, you just don't have a lot of maturity. You, 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 your, your focus a lot of times, not always, there's always exceptions, but generally speaking, you know, you're focused on kind of materialistic things, things that don't really matter. Um, you know, I, I mean, listen, I remember as a kid, I, I, I say as a kid, I wasn't really a kid. I remember being, you know, uh, 17, 18, 19 and saying to myself, man, I sure hope that, that the world doesn't end because I really like to get married. Well, I mean, I'm glad I'm married. I love my wife. Don't get me wrong. But now I'm thinking to myself, man, I would love the Mashiach to come and let there be a redemption like today. You know what I'm saying? It's like it's a different way of thinking, right? And I'm sure the Rebbe Seaman tell you the same thing, even though I'm the love of her life and I'm basically in her bread and butter. But other than that, <laughs> I'm the honey on her biscuit. But listen, but ser <laughs> but seriously, but we, we think more mature now. And so here's what happens, though, and here's the problem. Um. As a young family, you spend a lot of years figuring this out, and I and I understand. Please, I, I'm not chastising you, but you you hear the truth and hear the truth and hear the truth and hear the truth, and you know you allow a lot of different things, pastors in your ear, you know the draw towards materialism, whatever, 
to pull you away from the truth, maybe your friends and so forth, you know, your peer pressure, family pressure, mom and dad pressure. And all the while, while you're trying to figure things out, ultimately, you know in your soul that Torah is the way of life, that Judaism is the is the true religion, and that Yeshua as a Jewish Messiah is the real Messiah. The problem is your kids are growing up and they're getting, you know, you're dragging them all over. You're dragging them to church, dragging them to the Messianic, dragging them to the Hebrew root, dragging them over here, dragging them over there. And all I'm trying to encourage you to do is just go with what your heart knows is true. See, Pharaoh knew that Hashem was God. He knew this was truth, but a lot of different things got in his mind. And therefore, he continued to harden his heart. And as a result, um, God eventually just gave him over. And so I'm just encouraging you. What I'm trying to really say is make the choice now to follow the truth. Don't wait. And even if you don't understand it all. Which, by the way, do we ever always understand it all? No, of course not. Now, what's that have to do with locusts? Well, the reason I brought this up, aside from the fact that it's in the scripture here, is that <clears throat> this happens during the eighth plague or right before the eighth plague of locusts. What does that mean? Well, it means that uh, if you look at the pattern, Pharaoh kind of... Um, Pharaoh kind of hardened his heart, kind of, kind of, while the game was still going. I mean, there's going to be three more plagues, right? In other words, we think that, oh, well, you know, God doesn't turn, he wouldn't turn us over until it was pretty much all over, but that's not exactly true. That's, that's the point I'm trying to make. There's still three more plagues to go. There's still a lot of more time left on the clock, but in, 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 but in this situation, you see, he went ahead and gave him over. So the encouragement to us is just not, let's not get there. So if you're a young family and you have young kids, I'm going to go ahead and give you a spoiler alert. At the end of your searching, Lapid Judaism is, 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 is what you're going to end up finding. This, this is the gold at the end of the rainbow. This is the truth. Let me save you a lot of time and save a lot of heartache and save you a lot of wasted effort. And most importantly, save your kids. Because right now when they're 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, they're really pliable. They're really there for understanding. When they get a little bit older, it's a little bit, it's not impossible, not impossible, but it's more challenging to turn the heart of a 15 and 16 and 17 year old and totally rearrange their life. That's not impossible, but it's, but it's, it's more challenging. So let me save you that headache and just go ahead and come all in now because you're not going to, you're not going to turn around and find out that Lapid Judaism is, is falsehood. You're, that's not going to be what you discover. What you discover after you've gone the whole gamut is you're going to find out, you know what? That, I, yeah, I should have been, been going there for years. Of course, I can tell you right now. And listen, y'all tell me on the chat. There's people right now chatting that wish they had found this when they were 20. Wish they had found this when they were 30. Wish they had found this when they were 40. Okay? So if you're young and you're listening to me, don't waste your time. Don't waste your time. And whatever silly objection you're receiving from pastor, who knows what, I get, I, pro, I, I will bet you $1,000 it can be overcome. I know it can. You know, I'm like the casino, the house casino. You never bet against the house. Why? Because we know we're going to win. So the Exodus, it says here in the commentary to the um, the Kale Tumash, the Exodus was the release from, from oppression and constricting philosophies and lifestyle in order to live a life dedicated to to God's transcendent reality. This is what I was going back to when I was talking about the blood of the lamb is about redemption. It's a very important distinction to make. Are, are we are are our sins washed away once we come into the covenant? Yes. Yes, that's true. It even talks about that the children of Israel when we came to Mount Sinai, all of our sins were washed away, but but that wasn't the point of the blood of the lamb. The point of the blood of the lamb was to take us out of oppression and constriction and wrong thinking and, and 
and constricting philosophy and lifestyle, which, by the way, was in Egypt, and that, that was an anti-Torah lifestyle. That was a, 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 there was no law of Moses in, in Egypt. And through the blood of the Lamb, we actually were brought into, redeemed freedom into a life in which we can embrace God's transcendent reality, a.k.a. Torah, law of Moses. That was the point. Now, in that process, our sins were wiped away and washed away. That's great, but that wasn't the focus. Does that make sense? It's a byproduct, but the focus is redemption. It's not about forgiveness of sins. And this, is, to me, is a very, 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 very dot, 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 bold, all caps, underline italic, very important point to make because otherwise it skews your focus. Anybody done any sailing or any open open ocean, open water? I'm talking where you can't see land. You're just out there. Anybody ever done that? Well, if you've, and I, and I did this, I haven't been on a boat in, in 30 years. Okay. But back, back in the day, I was actually, my job in the, in the core, I was part of a Raider unit. And my specific job was to be the one who piloted the Raider craft, Raider boat, inserting, you know, sniper teams and SEAL teams and all that kind of stuff, uh, recon teams. Well, you leave the ship and you're on a boat and you're headed to shore. But the problem is the shore is miles away and you can't see it and it's night. So what do you do? Or daytime for that matter. But nighttime was always more fun. Ha <laughs> ha. Well, what do you do? Well, you stare at that compass and you better, you better keep your heading right on the, on the, on the green glow. Why? Because depending on how far you are away from the, from your target destination, if you get off by just a little bit, you could end up miles, maybe even hundreds of miles, depending on how far out you are from where you're supposed to land. And that would be, oh, I don't know, bad. So as the, as the coxswain of the raid of the Raider team, it was my job to make sure we hit the beach at the right spot. And that's, that's, that was under pressure. But you know, the point in fact here is this is why I, I teach what I teach and I teach the way I teach it is because it matters. If you think the blood of the lamb is just about sins being forgiven that's part of it, but see, now you're on the wrong heading, and that's going to put you on the wrong beach. You have to understand that the blood of the Lamb was about redeeming you from a Torahless life to bring you into Mount Sinai. Do your sins get forgiven in the process? Yes, but that's not the point. So you got to be on the right heading, otherwise you'll land on the right, wrong mountain. So it says, um, another interesting insight here from the Kel Tumash related to this. Before Pharaoh was crushed, God redeemed whatever good there was in Egypt. Non-Jews who wished to accompany the Jews were allowed to do so, and the Jews took with them an abundance of material wealth. Only when nothing of redeeming value remained in Egypt did God deal the crushing blow. So, one may wonder, why is it that Lapid Judaism has this focus on getting, on, on, let me put it this way. Why is our focus on finding holy sparks? Somebody asked me a question one time, one of our members at the time. And I thought it was an interesting question because uh, they had been with us for, I don't know, six months or a year or something like that. And they sat down, they said, you know, is is, is our goal to get people converted? My answer was, yeah. Yes. Yes. Which, by the way, is tantamount to saying, get people saved. By the way, here's another shocking thing for you. Or, or uh, maybe that shocking is not the right word, but a different way to think about things. Yaakov, our, our brother here in the community, shared a 
a post, uh, a comment on, on the men's Lapeat chat. And he made a, a, a subtle statement that when I read it, jumped right out at me. And I said, man, that, that is so powerful. He was talking about witnessing the people who don't believe in, in Yeshua, the actual Messiah, and therefore a Torah life. And his statement was that, and by the way, this is about to get me in trouble, so I don't care. Um, but it says, he said, because I don't care if, see, I don't mind if truth gets me in trouble. That doesn't bother me at all. I don't like it when lies are told. But I don't, I don't mind truth getting me in trouble. But anyway, I digress. He said, um, this is a great witness to non-believers. And the interesting thing was, and, he's, and this has to do with the scenario he was talking about. He said, that's a great witness to non-believers. And what was interesting about what, what Yaakov said and the way he said it was, he was talking about Christians. Oh, by the way, Shiloh, everybody see Shiloh on the chat? You know what's so wild? I'm sorry, I'm, this is probably going to bore you to tears. But Shiloh and I were in the same Raider unit in the Marines. It's just that Shiloh was getting out of that unit just as I was coming in. In fact, it is very likely that Shiloh and I were standing in the same company formation, you know, at one point, it's so crazy. We just we didn't know each other, but and, and the reason I say this because the Raider unit was basically like a, at the time, a special unit like ops, special ops kind of stuff, and so very very few Marines in this unit ever. <laughs> so anyway, it's crazy. It's crazy, insane. But I digress. So look, so so Yanko was talking about Christians, and it's interesting. Now, I'm not here to tell you whether or not Aunt Susie went to heaven when she died and she was a Christian all her life. Okay, I'm not here to judge anybody at all. I'm really not. That is up to Hashem. And only he knows what people know and all this kind of stuff, right? So I'm not here to judge anybody's salvation. And so I would appreciate if you don't judge mine. Thank you very much. But having said that, if we just look at things reality, just looking at reality, looking at what the Bible actually teaches. The reality is, if you deny the law of Moses, if you deny that we're supposed to be co come into covenant and go to Sinai, then you're a non-believer, according to the Bible. Now, ho, 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 don't, don't turn me off yet. Understand that Moses was telling the people, you're going to be delivered from Egypt. Eat this lamb. Put the blood on the doorpost. Circumcise yourself because we're leaving here and we're going to Sinai. For what purpose? To receive the law of Moses, which will become known as the law of Moses. Well, if you're standing there in Egypt and you say, well, I, I want the blood of the lamb. Check. I want to eat the Passover lamb. Check. I'm, I'm kind of out on circumcision. I don't do that anymore. It's about the spirit, not the flesh. And I want to be set free from Egypt. Check. But I don't want to go to Sinai because that's a big buzzkill. I would rather not have any laws, particularly circumcision or Sabbath. Thank you. I really like pork chops. And you therefore say, yeah, I'm out. Guys. This is not a buffet. You don't get to pick the parts you like. You're a non-believer at that point. And I think it's really important. Again, we want to stay on the right heading so we hit the right beach. That we, we're crystal clear on that. So as Lapid Jews, we're out there seeking non-believers, and that includes Christians. I know. Why? Well, because first and foremost, that's the heart of God. But beyond that, why? And the answer goes back to our insight here that before the final redemption can come, we have to empty Egypt of all the holy sparks and all the redeemable things. The sages say that when the people went door to door looking for gold and silver, Moses went door to door looking for souls because he recognized that the gold and silver God was talking about was the people that were the holy sparks. 
And it's saying here that when all those holy sparks were found, when all those Gentiles who would become Jews were found, then the Exodus could come. So one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons why we seek the holy sparks is because, yeah, it's the heart of God, and that's what God wants. That's what that's what the, the Bible teaches. Does the Bible teach about Messianic Gentiles? No. Is there any support for that in Scripture? No. Any support for that in rabbinic literature? No. Is it made up and false and phony by Paul? Absolutely, 100%. Fake and phony. Plastic banana, good time rock and roll. What does the Bible actually teach? It teaches that the Gentiles are going to become Jews. That's what it says. Is that what Judaism teaches? Yeah. 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 Actually, yes. Is that what Abraham and Sarah believed? Yep. Is that what Moses believed? Yep. Joseph? Yep. Isaac? Yep. So that's what really happened. So this is, this is, and this is why you can't harden your heart. Because by you not hardening hardening your heart, two things happen. Number one, you're a holy spark. Number two, you become a Jew. And as a result of that, the redemption draws near. near. It's. (laughs) All right. One on this note, one final insight for this morning. You know, as as is always the case, there's so much to be said. But let me let me say this one final insight because this will kind of uh, correlate with what I'm talking about here. Not hard, hardening our hearts, and particularly with the plague of locusts. Would the Israelites have accepted the Torah on Mount Sinai if they had not if they had if they had not experienced the extraordinary miracles of Egypt? It is possible that they would not have, as is evident from the first words of the Ten Commandments, where God represents Himself to the people as the one who brought them out of Egypt. This confirms that the the Exodus was the foundation of their belief in Him. Now, I want to emphasize one more time that remember when God told Moses to go at at the burning bush, he said that your whole purpose is to bring those people back here. And in fact, the sign that I've sent you is that you will bring them back here. Well, where is here? Here is Sinai. What's, What's Sinai known for? The law of Moses. Therefore, if they don't come with you here, that's because they didn't believe. It says, these words call to mind the words ending in verse 2 that you may know through the plagues of Egypt that I am Hashem. This remained the supreme goal of the divine acts in Egypt. Ultimately, listen to this, ultimately the salvation of humanity would depend upon the realization of this purpose. What is it saying there? What is Rabbi Monk saying there? He's saying that the whole exodus was a picture for humanity that God is the Redeemer, and he wants you to be part of that mixed multitude that came out of Egypt with us. That is the salvation. Salvation of humanity is leaving Egypt and going to Sinai. That is the true believer. Don't harden your heart, because Lapid Judaism is the truth. Guys, Lapid Judaism is going to be here until the Messiah comes, and Bezrat Hashem, I'll be the rabbi as long as Hashem allows me to live. And there'll be other leaders and other rabbis too eventually because we'll have more congregations across the nation and worldwide, maybe soon in our time. In other words, what I'm trying to say you to you, I'm, what I'm trying to tell you is we're not going anywhere. In fact, we're just going to continue to grow Bezrat Hashem as we continue to follow Hashem. My, when all I'm trying to do is encourage you to let go of the noise and embrace the truth. Don't be like Pharaoh. Don't harden your heart because eventually there might come a point where you don't have a choice. End of our Aliyah today. Thank you so much for being here. Stay warm today. It is cold outside. Good night. But... It is warm in our hearts as we study the word. So let's come together tomorrow with with the God's help and study more of Par Shabo. Until then, have an amazing and great and wonderful day. See you then. Shalom Aleichem.